Welcome. I'm Professor Rob Walcott with the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. I'm here today at the Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This is in many ways the birthplace of complexity theory, chaos, a whole lot of other visions of the future of humanity. One of the people I have the privilege to work with today here at the Institute is Mr. John Klippinger. John founded ID Cubed. He's a member of the MIT Media Lab and has spent a number of years in the past at the Harvard Law School. So in his range of, uh, the range of his career, he's seen this challenge from multiple dimensions. John, welcome and thank you for being here with thank us. Thank you for having me. So uh, given all the things you think about, and it's a lot, I first have to say thank you. You were the first person, this was probably about four years ago when we met at, at, in Jackson Hole right. for a conference. You were the first person to introduce to me the notion of the blockchain. And, and it wasn't just the Bitcoin cryptocurrencies, I mean, that, that people start, have started to talk a lot about that. But even at that time, you were saying this underlying methodology of blockchain, what else can we do with it? How can, right. we, how can we change the right. way that people organize and contract? Right. And that opened my mind uh, ever since. So uh, what are you interested in today? Well, I'm very much interested in new forms of organization. I think that we're at a, a critical uh, juncture right now where we're seeing the, the systemic failures of a lot of institutions of, of industrial democracy. And it's not just in the US, it's pervasive. And what we're starting to see is emergence of a new way of social ordering. It's more decentralized. And so when I mentioned the blockchain, the blockchain is one component of that. Um, and what we're starting to see is, is that rather than having a central notion of authority, you can have distributed forms of authority, distributed forms of organization that are self-organizing. And this has been brought about by new technologies. It's not just the, the blockchain itself. Uh, it's not just machine learning. It's a combination of mobile phones, the things you can do off of mobile phones, the data you can get off mobile phones, GPS. Uh, you have also the ability to, to create virtual containers of information in the cloud. And so we're, we're, we're creating networks and networks around the world that are challenging the traditional ways in which we've governed ourselves as nation states. Uh, they're traditionally sort of a top-down hub-and-spoke model to something that's much more distributed. The power is not in the center, it's at the edge. Uh, and so there are very fundamental changes that are taking place. And then you compound that with new kinds of technologies that are coming on, um, all the way from new kinds of neuroscience, synthetic biology, to machine learning, to AI, right. that we're creating a whole new environment. And so we have to have new ways of thinking about it. And, and the thing that I've been concentrating on is what I call an open sector. It's sort of, it's not the public sector, it's not the private sector, and it's not under the, the control of a government or even, a, say, UN or something like that. It's almost a set of open protocols. So we espouse a notion of self-sovereign identity, self-sovereign data, mm. um, which is a sort of a radical concept. Because it's not, it's, it, it, but it's in the protocol itself. Is it, is it some sort of shadow sector that uh, cuts across well, the it, established I, sector? I, society, I, 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 would, I wouldn't call it a shadow sector, but I, it, it's certainly like a meta sector. It's, okay. it's, sort, of, sort of, it's something between. Uh, it's, it's an outbirth of, uh, an outgrowth of the open sector, the open source sector. So the whole concept of open source software, the mm. building, which has now taken over software development. Uh, where you have collaborations across different organizations. No one owns it. It's owned by everybody and nobody. Yeah. And so you want to have a space where it's, where it's safe to genuinely innovate and fundamentally innovate mm. and not be under the thumb of, of a particular interest. Uh, and so what we found in, 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 in looking in, say, working in different cities and trying to do genuine innovation in smart cities and things like that is that once you try to do things, say, through a public-private partnership, you, it, it, that each of those parties say, well, no, I want to have it twisted here. I want to have it done this. I want, right. to, I want to keep our interest at stake. And so they try to fold back the innovation in terms of what allows them to keep their legacy To fit it system. into the existing Fitting box. existing categories. Maintain and really, control. And this is where like, something like uh, you know, open source and, 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 and even the things like you know, Burning Man, that whole where you have a tabla rasa, you have, you have a green field where you or, can or generally... A, or a desert, know, actually. A desert field, field, so to speak. A desert, yes, yeah. a desert <laughs> field. Uh, yeah. You have a desert where you, there's nothing there. Right. And whatever you do is what you create. And, and you're free to create anything. There's no expectation. It's, it's, well, it's a radical uh, notion of a, in, invention. Right. So we have networks and networks. And, 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 and part of that is this kind of architecture is, is 
and it ties into the, what's been done here in the complexity sciences, is if you have really complex control processes, that's the only way you can scale control in a decentralized phase. But, but explain that for us, because by saying, for, for many people, if you say yeah. we have to have a complex control system, then that evokes notions of very difficult, very hard to understand, difficult to implement. But you're not saying that, right? You're no, no, something no, no. we've I, talked I, earlier about emergent governance, evolvable governance. Right. Tell us about that. I mean, I, the, the thing is, rather than try to impose a set of rules, you so you try to you try to create a set of initial conditions that which people's rules come out of and principles come out of. I mean, one of the ways of looking at this is is common law, um, mm -hmm. and, and 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 one of the best pieces that ever been written in common law is. is uh, by Holmes, uh, Oliver Wendell, Wendell Holmes. Holmes, and this right. is like in 1878, and he wrote a, a very powerful piece on, on common law, and he went back to common law, began with customs, and then in norms, and then it gets codified in laws, and they're constantly evolving, so we're emerging. It wasn't something that was top down, and it was constantly reinventing itself around the circumstances, and there was no single yeah. point of control. So you think, we think of things like digital common law. What's equivalent to digital common law? And that's something that should reside in an open sector that is not under the thumb of any particular legacy interest. The problem of genuine innovation is that each party, whether it be in the public sector or the private sector, wants to preserve their standing within the right. current status quo. Right. And now we're talking about things that are profoundly transformative. Uh, they were making it transitional. And so that has to be the freedom to be in this new sector. So give us an example of, of, of an open sector kind of an environment that already exists. Well, I mean, what we're, I mean, I, as I mentioned, I think the, you can look at the open source software movement as part of an open sector. Um, but what we're looking at is how do you create a protocol, for example, uh, that allow people to get an identity that be verified, to be biometrically, mm -hmm. uh, behavior metrically verified, uh, that other authorities, public and private sector, could accept, but it's not controlled by them. And my own data is something that I would control under a set of protocols or rules that would go in the cloud that would not be under necessarily the jurisdiction of a particular government. Mm. Um, and the reason this is important is that as more and more data is collected about ourselves, our digital cells, our digital subject, is going to be something that either we control or some other party controls. Right yeah. now, it's, right. it's captured by different companies, Googles and the Facebooks. Right. And so if there's gonna have any kind of real independent freedom, then we have to have access and control over that. And that would exist in this new sector. So would, would an organization like ICANN be a representative of this, or is this well, an I mean, older I, version yeah, of yeah, that's a, that's a, really a good transitional point. model, for instance? I, I, I'm of the opinion that's like an, a, a transitional model. I mean, and so ICANN, I mean, I'm very close to the people who started In other words, governing that, the, the internet, right. the rules of engagement on the internet. Right, and then that was for, for an allocation of names and the, yeah. the, name, the domain space. Right. But, but here, we're, we're trying to get a consensus as to uh, what is a digital credential that is acceptable that then allows a certain parts of commerce to take place and people to express themselves freely mm. and form new kinds of organizations and economies. And this is where the cryptocurrency comes in. This is where right. that, not just Bitcoin, but there's a proliferation of other kind of coins. And you can create different kinds of decentralized banks and decentralized authorities and institutions this mm -hmm. way. Such as the experiment in Ethereum and, and groups Exactly, like right. this. Ethereum. And, and Ethereum is one example of that. Yeah. So there's a whole community of people who are looking at how to create these alternatives with anticipation that their the current institutional frameworks are being extremely challenged. Right, and there's a lack of trust in many totally. of our existing institutions. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I don't think it's, it's going to say too far that a lot of people think the financial reforms that we've had are not working. They haven't got far in it, and, yeah. and it's just a matter of time where we're, we're going to have another crisis. Another, right. another crisis. And then right. you compound that with other crises of legitimacy and, and governments and voting and, and the, the kinds of, uh, leadership that's out there now that we're really we're at a, a, a critical point in the next couple of years. So so far we've been at a very uh, macro and even theoretical level, yeah, yeah. but let's 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 look at a specific example, something you've been very involved in for a while, the the Burning Man. Uh, briefly, for anyone who doesn't know what it is, and maybe there are seven people who still don't, but tell people briefly what it is, and then how does this relate to your notion of open sector? Okay, I mean, uh, so Burning Man is a um, 
you could describe it as a two-week festival um, that it takes place in Black Rock Desert, and, and it's been going for over 25 years. Wow. And it started as a small group, and now there's up to 70,000 people each year. And what they do is they come out, and, it's, and they have 10 principles by which they govern themselves. And it's sort of like a spontaneous, self-organizing community where the, it's a gift exchange system. Uh, it's, it's, there's, no, there's no currency. It's like, uh, and it's predicated on art. And so it's, it's very, it's, it's sort of a combination of art and humor and self-deprecation uh, in which uh, people create phenomenal pieces of art in, in, mm. in the desert. Um, and they have things like art cars. And they, and they, sort, of, they sort of emulate or imitate new current sort of world uh, institutions in the, what they call the default world. In, in the so the rest world. of us are in the default, in the default world. world. Now, right. what's happened with Burning Man um, is, is that there are Burning Man organizations around the world. So they're burners around the world. And they're setting up their own parallel efforts. Mm -hmm. And there is an experiment in new kinds of living and social ordering that are very much bottom up, not top down, around sets of principles. And something that seems to be consistent across many of these emergent systems, governance systems, organizations, open sector, is... Uh, a, a, a small set of clear principles. Right. And then people act around those principles, through those principles, but what they do emerges up from the grassroots. Absolutely. I mean, what, what, one of the lessons of Burning Man, and, and, and I mean, talk to the founders, they had a, a sort of existential moment in Burning Man about 1995 or 96, where they, it, it was a festival, people coming together, but there wasn't sufficient structure. It sort of, it sort of became Mad Max. Right. And, 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 and they had some deaths, and, they had, and it, got, it got, went over the edge. And so they had to start to think about what sort of principles, what sort of like simple orderings that they could put down and how they organized the camps that would lead to more civil behavior. Mm. And, and that actually, that innovation is what really resulted in Burning Man as we now know it and scaling to 70,000 people that come together that people who do not necessarily know each other and are able to have this, this really civil experience. Interesting. So that evolution occurred as a result of a response to right. an existential crisis. Oh, yeah. There was, the it, was, it, it could have gone down. They, that could have been the end of it. The, the Bureau of Land Management could have closed them down. Right. Uh, and there was they, talk of that. Yeah, too. there were definitely there was talk about And they have those moments from time to time. Right. They have other challenges. Right. And so it's always about how much you do from top down to bottom up and, and sometimes you need a nudge from the top, and sometimes you allow things to come up from the bottom. Right. So right. it is sort of a, a living experiment. It's and trial and error. And the challenge is, how do you go from something like it's a, a festival to something as permanent communities mm. around on a global basis? So we had a retreat that we brought together people around the world, and they're starting to discuss how to scale Burning Man. Uh, and, 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 uh, and so there are a lot of challenges in that. I think it... Burning Man is just one example of a lot of similar efforts that you see around the world. Yeah. So there are these festivals, there, are this, there is this kind of thinking about new kind of social ordering, um, and particularly among uh, a millennial generation who, are, who have think of their, their place and, and how they gather and what's legitimate and not legitimate in their world and what to be trusted than more of the traditional structures. So, so it, it is, it's a leading indicator. I think, of some of these things happen. So this open sector truly starts to overlap with and directly interact with the more traditional sectors of That's society. That's exactly right. You want something to compete with the, with the traditional sector. Right. And that it subsume more, as it, it, it starts to be more effective and get gen, it gets genuine authority, genuine legitimacy, then it's going to shape both the sectors. Right. And it'll grow on its own. It doesn't necessarily have to dominate. It, it, it's sort of a, a, a co-evolution, as it were. Interesting. Burning Man has always struck me a little bit as, as a 21st century analog of some of the ferment of the mid-19th century in the United States, so the, the utopian communities and trying to find new ways to order socially and, right. and all of this. Not that anyone's suggesting that Burning Man is a utopia. It certainly might feel like that for a couple weeks. Right. But, uh, but you mentioned other examples around the world. Can you think of another open sector relevant example where people are experimenting with this kind of a construct? Well, there there are all. I mean, there 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 are various like communal groups. Uh, they're they're in Spain. Uh, there are groups in Spain, and Italy, and Greece. 
Um, there are all these, these spontaneous collaboratives that are coming up. Um, and they, and, and Berlin, uh, and, and so as, and a lot of them in urban areas, because when you have, and the nation state is sort of not a, a very effective way of organizing things, so it goes back to the city, mm. and say, oh, how do we create regions of a city that are, reflect these values, and are, and it's a, it's a level of governance that people can participate in and be effective in. Right. So you're seeing this a lot of different cities of how to do this, create these new kind of self-ordering, uh, order ordering communities. Right. These are monumental changes we'll be seeing in the next couple of generations. Um, how do you think about this as an individual or a leader? What If I'm a, a citizen of the world and I'm looking at these changes that are, that are being wrought around me, how do I think differently, act differently to prepare to be engaged in a positive yeah. way as an individual and then also as a leader? Well, I, I feel, I mean, I feel this is really, uh, this is critical stuff. <laughs> I, I think that, that there's a real responsibility to think about it and not sort of to deny it. And, and, and typically what you'll have is, um, and one person described it as innovation theater. <laughs> oh, we'll innovate, mm -hmm. we'll act it out, but we're, we're, it's a way of inoculating ourselves from actually really then looking at it. So this whole transition from sort of uh, hub-and-spoke, top-down industrial democracy into yeah. a decentralized service represents a huge change and shift in power and influence in their institutional forms. And is it, is it going to be a, a, a soft landing, a hard landing, or a landing at all? I mean, how do we do that? Right. And I think that's much, it's, it's happening a lot faster than we think. And I, I think that we have to sort of look at the hard facts and be able not to try to put a spin on it or deny it, but to be as, as, as clear as we can. And as leaders, I think people have an understand, a requirement to understand this. And a lot of people say, oh, this is technology and I'll have someone else. No, you have an obligation to understand this. Right. And that is, I mean, I find in having, say, go to China with a lot of engineers, Chinese leaders in it, they get this stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't have that literacy so much in the U.S., one of the things I admire about your background is it's quite diverse. You've had executive roles at for-profit companies, yep. including Coopers and Librand, for a number of years. Yep. Uh, what advice would you give to senior leaders of business in terms of how they need to be addressing these changes and challenges? I think this is, uh, I mean, this is really is really tricky because I, I think that that their businesses have to get on the learning curve and they start to have to doing experiments. They have to be engaged. And, and, and I, I don't think it's enough to sort of have people come in and, and sort of explain to them in, and over a period of time. I think they have to sort of start making real commitments to uh, experiments. So you'll see what's happening in, in the banking world, um, that there are uh, over 50, 60 banks are now experimenting with the blockchain. Um, but they're just experiments, um, and I Which think at this phase is probably the right thing to do. I mean, you don't yeah, want to go I, big I think, before. I, no, it's true because it's early. So right. I, I, I think it's early. But I think they need to learn how to think in these terms and acculturate themselves in these terms. What so often is they say, "Well, we'll wait till it matures and then right. we'll jump in." And I did a, a I wrote a piece on this with an institutional investor, and that's what the newspapers did. Mm -hmm. And look where it got them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the banks are vulnerable to the same thing. But it's not just banks. It's also governments, mm -hmm. governance, mm -hmm. and how to th how think what their role is. And, 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 and their, their, their position and their privilege in that process is going to be challenged. Um, so they're, 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 there's, there's a real need for leaders to, to take their organization and, and, and get up on the learning curve as quickly as they can and start doing projects and, and, and understand and, and viscerally experience what, it, what this is going to be. Related to this question, and we're coming down to the, to the conclusion of the interview, but I, you can edit this. Um, so related to this question, these new open sector opportunities yeah. are rising. Clearly, we're already seeing reframing yeah. of uh, so society, social institutions, privacy, people's relationships to right. each other. Uh, uh, in, in, supranational organizations are starting are under great stress, whether that's the United Nations or NATO, et right. cetera. So the world is being redrawn. Nonetheless, we have are generally organized into more traditional types of social structures, whether they're corporations or national governments. Right. Supranational governments. 
what advice would you give to leaders of these kinds of large business, uh, uh, national governments? They're still vital. They're still critical. Meanwhile, though, the level of trust across the board, across the planet, has plummeted right. for them. What advice would you give them to try and remain relevant in this changing world? I think that it's not like they're going to go away. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to, but I think they're, it's like they're, it's organic. They're, 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 their role will change a bit. And I think, you know, so the role of, of, of the state may be to create sort of, it's sort of like a meta role <laughs> that, that a lot of the power will go to more a local level. So it may go to the cities. And, and they may have a higher level coordination role, and there's certain things they're going to do, and things are going to be more networked. Um, I mean, I think you're seeing networks of cities linking to cities, um, and, and so cities are naturally forming their own alliances oh, and right. affinities among themselves because they reflect commercial, cultural connections. Yeah. So and I think Richard Daly said all politics are local. Yep. Perhaps it was somebody before no, him. No, it was Tim, Tip O'Neill. Right. Tip O'Neill. Yeah, it's okay, another great. Irishman. All right, yeah, there yeah, we go. Right. 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 Um, but yeah, you're, you, and, and, and so how you design local currency, you're going to have new kinds of currency. And so it, it, it's like, well, rather than try to get involved in the particulars and hold on to sort of legacy influence, set the meta rules and recognize that. Um, and... Uh, but that's a, that's a huge challenge. And but I, I think that they're they're going to lose influence. I mean, and and what's going to happen is is that it's a default city's going to assume a much bigger role mm. because because they're going to be they're going to be these failures. So people default to the city. And they're going to default to these more private organizations. And that's where the open sector is really important. Let it flourish, mm. and then let it and it can make mistakes, and then glean out what starts to work, and then and then it can be codified. And then it becomes part of a natural evolutionary process. A natural process. evolutionary process rather than try to cap, cap it down cap it. and, and over-regulate over all its particulars. That's particularly interesting because I see a direct analog to what we're doing with corporations now and trying to think through how the economy and business value chains and ecosystems are changing. Yeah. So with all of these technologies that, that you know better than anyone, the blockchain and distributed energy generation and 3D printing and all these things, they distribute agency, the ability to make Sorry, decisions. Right. They distribute access to information. They sensing, Internet of Things, all these right, things. Right. They distribute the ability to produce things at smaller, more granular right, right. levels in the economy. And so therefore, what we're seeing happening in business, so this will continue over the next couple generations, is we're pushing the production and provision of yes. products and services ever closer to the moment of demand. Absolutely right. And when you realize that foresight, you see how every business ecosystem is going to get ripped apart over the next 20 or 30 years. Right. And you're seeing a similar dynamic happening within government, society, governance, etc. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, so whether you talk about the sharing economy, the on-demand economy, the whole ability to have things data-driven and basically on-demand right. is changing. So you can see this with happening in, uh, in ride-handling services and things like that. So you got GPS, so you get, you're, you're going to have a way of, of dynamically allocating your transportation infrastructure is going to be, rather than be fixed, it'll be dynamic. Uh, I think work, it, it, what, what kind of jobs I get, what kind of credentials I have are going to be dynamic. And, 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 and so it's not going to be these fixed structures anymore. And it's going to be data driven in the sense, so you're going to be mitigating risk in real time, and computing risk, in, and that's where the machine learning becomes a big deal. Right. So it's, it's like the highly dynamic a system that's going to be taking place around all categories of, 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 uh, of society. You are one of those people in the world that has had the privilege to work on things you're clearly passionate about for a very long time. What is one thing that you are most proud of in the work that you've done in your life? Is something you'd like to be, I guess, let's be honest, remembered for? Well, that's hard. I mean, um... I mean, the thing that meant the most to me mm. uh, was SOMA. From a technology point of view is that I've always been interested in the area of self-organizing systems. I mean, for 30 years. And that wasn't always the most current thing. And now to see these things coming together right. and people talking about the concept of self-sovereign identity and all that, and that actually is now part of a, a broader conversation, the, the Treasury and the EU and all these things are now starting to get adopted. 
and which are, they were considered, considered to be really way out ideas just five or six years ago. Uh, that, that makes me feel good. And if that happens and that is really institutionalized and that becomes scale, I feel, I feel a sense of accomplishment in that because that's something that I've been advocating my whole life. Um, so that, that is important to me. Well, it's also important to all the rest of us, John. Thanks so much for your, for your work okay. over the years. 